The next macromolecule we're going to talk about is the protein. So we've talked about carbohydrates, and their building blocks were monosaccharides, which made polysaccharides, complex carbohydrates. We've talked about fats, or lipids, and fatty acids and glycerol made triglycerides. In proteins, the building blocks are called amino acids. So I have here a diagram of an amino acid, and you would need to be able to recognize this picture as an amino acid. So there's some parts that all amino acids have in common. They all have on one side, they have an alpha carbon in the middle. This carbon in the middle, see the little fish symbol? That means alpha. So this is called an alpha carbon, the central carbon. All amino acids have an amino group. It's where the amino comes from, an amino acid. They all have on the other side of that carbon a carboxyl or carboxylic acid group. Notice that's where the acid comes from. So this is where the name amino acid comes from. And then on that alpha carbon, they have a hydrogen. And then the last thing that's on every amino acid is called an R group. And here's the thing. There are 20 different things that can go in this spot. And therefore, in our bodies, there are 20 different amino acids. The only part that differs is the R group. The other parts are the same in every amino acid. And I'll show you a diagram of this in a moment. So a little bit about R groups. Again, they are the most important part. They're the only part that differs in each amino acid. And when these amino acids hook together and make a protein, a polypeptide chain, um, that protein is going to fold up into a shape. And the, the uh, biggest thing that's going to affect how it folds up will be the R groups. So I listed just a couple of rules about this. For example, some R groups are polar. Remember what that means. There's an uneven sharing. That means they like water, for one thing. And we're 70% water. So when these proteins fold up, our groups that like water are going to end up on the outside of that protein. Um, and this includes amino, which it happens to also be, uh, it's a functional group we talked about, um, but that can be one of the R groups or part of an R group. It also includes hydroxyl. Nonpolar R groups don't like water. Remember, nonpolar things are hydrophobic. And so these parts, when a protein folds up, these parts are going to want to end up probably on the inside, away from the water. They also will react with other R groups that are also nonpolar, like things, things with like types of charges will react with one another nicely. Um, and so uh, methyl group is a good example, and the sulfhydryl group is another example of a nonpolar R group. So this next slide is just a picture of all the 20 amino acids showing their R groups. So again, you're not going to be required to draw these. You're also not going to be required to name them. You wouldn't have to look at an amino acid and say, oh, that's lysine. But notice they might not have the letter R in a picture of an amino acid. They might actually have a thing there. So this is the R group in arginine. This is the R group in glutamine. This is the R group in phenylalanine. So each of these amino acids has different R groups. And again, for example, here in alanine, it's a methyl group. So this would definitely be a nonpolar amino acid. Um, on the other hand, if we look, we may see one here that, um, like this one, that has an amino group on the end that may be polar on that end because that one's going to like water. Here's another one that's got an amino group as part of its R group, and this one as well. So depending on these R groups, it's going to determine how this protein, what its final shape is going to be, and we're going to talk about that later. All right. Um, so how do these hook together? So the way they hook together, it has a special name. It's called a peptide bond. But in essence, it's the same reaction that we've talked about that builds all the macromolecules that we've been discussing. It's called a condensation reaction. And so notice we have these two amino acids side by side. Here's the carboxyl group of one. And here's the amino group of the one next to it. And they line up side by side. And notice H and OH are going to get together and leave and form water. And here's our bond. And this is going to be called a peptide bond. Um, it's just a special name in proteins for the bond, but it's the same reaction. It's not any different than the condensation reaction that we talked about before. And this is showing a chain that's growing. You could be, in fact, I would say you will be, given a picture of a protein chain and asked how many amino acids are in the chain. Now, this one is a little easier because, honestly, the alpha carbons are colored red. So you're like, oh, well, this is easy. One, two, three. There's three amino acids in this chain. However, it, it, that's not going to be the case when you see this on a test. 
it's gonna, this carbon is gonna look exactly the same as the other carbon. And you're probably not gonna see a block that says met or ala or lu. You're gonna ha either have the letter R or you're gonna actually have R groups in that spot. So the key to figuring out how many amino acids are in a chain is the backbone. Remember that every amino acid individually is this, NCC. It's got the amino group on one side, the carboxyl group on the other, the alpha carbon in the middle that's got the R group attached to, etc. When they connect to each other, you're never going to lose that backbone, that NCC. So if I go here and look, I find NCC. That's my first amino acid. NCC, that's two amino acids. NCC, that's three amino acids. And then I could, I could answer the question. So even if the carbons in the middle don't look different, or you don't have these big blocks sticking off that make it easy to count how many uh, amino acids there are in the chain, that's how you could figure it out. All right, uh, what do proteins do? So why are they so important? Proteins, honestly, we've talked about carbohydrates. What do they mainly do? They were energy, energy molecules, right? Uh, glucose and fructose had to do with energy. I mean, yes, cellulose was in cell walls of plants, but um, in essence, energy was kind of what was associated with that. And then we had lipids, and lipids, again, were mostly associated with storing energy, right? Triglycerides. Um, there were the steroid hormones and phospholipids in the membrane, but that was really it. Proteins are the most important macromolecule, really, in your entire body. When you look at somebody, what you're looking at, really, is their proteins. So all the enzymes in your body, and we're going to do a whole chapter on enzymes, but enzymes speed up reactions. Just to give you an example, it probably take you days to digest one meal without enzymes. But you also have enzymes in every cell reaction, in the reactions going on in your brain, in your nervous system. Um, hormones, aside from the steroids, the other hormones in your body, for the most part, are all proteins. And hormones do all kinds of jobs for you. Antibodies that fight infections, viruses, and bacteria. Um, cell membrane receptors that pick up messages. Keratin, also collagen, also um, elastin. These are all proteins that are involved in giving us like elasticity in our skin and composing our hair and our fingernails and things like that. Hemoglobin that carries oxygen in our blood. Our muscles are made of protein. So almost every characteristic about us and every function that keeps us alive involves proteins. This is a picture of a protein. This is insulin all folded up. And honestly, you look at it and you're like, it looks like a three-year-old got a, like a molecular model kit and just put stuff randomly together. But actually, this has a very specific shape, which gives insulin its very specific job. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about what's called the levels of protein structure and how a protein ends up having this special shape. So that'll be tomorrow. And these are just some pictures of some of the things that proteins do. Enzymes, antibodies, or defensive proteins, they can store things like the albumin in eggs. Um, they transport things through in and out of the cell. Um, there's hormones, receptors that pick up messages, muscles, and then support proteins like heather, uh, feathers and horns in animals um, are, like I said, components of our skin. Also pigments in our skin. Um, all of those are involved as well. So we're going to skip to DNA. All right, so I skipped the section on protein levels of structure. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, nucleic acids. So this is our last macromolecule. So nucleic acids include things like DNA and RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and ribonucleic acid. They also include uh, ATP. Adenosine triphosphate is also a nucleic acid. So there's, there's several. And um, the building blocks, remember everything has building blocks, are called nucleotides. So you need to be able to rec uh, recognize a picture of a nucleotide. So I have some pictures here. Um, all nucleotides are composed of three parts. A sugar, which is actually going to either be ribose or deoxyribose. And so I'm going to color code this. This is the sugar. It's a pinto sugar, meaning a five-carbon sugar. It's kind of cut off on this bottom one. The second thing that all nucleotides have is a phosphate group, and that's this phosphate here. There's a phosphate here. This one happens to be ATP, so there's actually three phosphates here. But that's your phosphate group. In the DNA molecule here on the right, the phosphates, they, they get lazy and they just do a P with a circle around it. It's sort of like a shorthand way of writing phosphate. Uh, and then finally, the nitrogen base. So the nitrogen bases are... Uh, they contain nitrogen, so that's where the name comes from, and it's this entire thing. It can be a single ring or a double ring. The single ring ones are 
called pyrimidines and the other ones are called purines, and we're actually going to talk way more about them later. In DNA, the nitrogen bases were these. It was your A, T, G, C. Um, and in RNA, you may remember, so nitrogen bases in DNA, that was your A, T, G, C. In RNA, there was no T, there was U. We're honestly going to talk way more about nucleic acids in another chapter. So we're not going to get into detail here. But the most important thing is that they're made of nucleotides. The three parts of your nucleotide are always going to be a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. So you need to be able to recognize from a picture a nucleotide and some examples, DNA and RNA. Uh, the last thing I wanted to cover with you is what is, the, what is the job? What is the relationship between nucleic acids and proteins? So DNA is really instructions or directions for making proteins. We think about the nucleus and you always hear it's the control center, you know, and you kind of imagine that it's controlling everything, but that's a very general word. It's not really controlling everything. The only thing it's really doing, the nucleus and the DNA, it's coding, it's a bunch of codes, for what proteins you make. Now, since you're mostly made out of protein, right? Your, I, we just went through all the things proteins do as far as your structures and your functions. That makes the DNA very important. It, it's the most important thing because it's the code to tell your body when and which proteins are gonna be made. And if the DNA is damaged, if you have a mutation in your DNA, that means you're either not gonna make the right protein, you're gonna make a protein that's shaped wrong, or you might not make any protein at all. And that's really what your genetics is all about. When we think of genetics, you usually think about what you look like. You know, oh, your skin color, your hair color, your eye color. But the fact that you have two eyes and that they're located on your head and not on your butt, and the every enzyme in your body, every hormone in your body, everything about the, the structure of your nervous system, your, your fingerprints, all of that stuff um, is proteins that are being made and coded for by your DNA. So, um, so it's super important that you have that understanding of what DNA really does and what the relationship is between DNA and protein. And I have an example here just to show you. So DNA is the code, like I said, for making proteins. Everybody has a particular gene in their DNA that's the code for making the protein hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. Some people who have the genetic defect sickle cell anemia have a mutation in their DNA that they don't make their hemoglobin correctly. Now, what does that mean? It really just means, honestly, one letter of their DNA code is wrong. So we're talking about a DNA code that is probably a thousand letters long. So out of a thousand A, T, G, C letters in their DNA, in that particular gene, one letter's off. But that one letter being wrong changes the code. So you have this amino acid chain, or we just talked about amino acids. Those are the building blocks of your proteins. And one amino acid, which they're showing here, is incorrect. The amino acid that's supposed to go there is called glutamic acid. And glutamic acid happens to be hydrophilic. It's got polar R groups on it, which means that's going to cause the protein to fold up in a particular way when it reacts with all the other R groups and all the other amino acids. The DNA mistake codes for instead of that one amino acid being there and by the way this is out of a chain of 250 or more amino acids one of them only one one is wrong the amino acid that gets put there instead is called valine and valine if you notice this is all methyl groups so valine is actually hydrophobic well what happens is because of that one amino acid out of 250 plus the entire red blood cell folds up wrong so it should fold up like this nice round circle holds oxygen, carries oxygen through the blood cell. Instead, and especially in lower oxygen environments, the red blood cell collapses into this sickle shape. What does that mean? It doesn't carry oxygen like it's supposed to, so you feel anemic, which gives you these, you're tired, um, you feel worn out, you have no energy, and this is actually kind of sharp at the ends, so it can actually clog up the blood vessels. And with no treatment, this can actually be um, deadly. Uh, in this country, we have treatment for sickle cell anemia, but people may need blood transfusions. They take all kinds of medications. And even with all of that, they may have a shorter lifespan than someone that doesn't have this disorder. So that can just show you the extreme of what can happen if an amino acid is wrong in a protein chain or if the DNA has a mistake in it, which then ultimately leads to, to, uh, to this problem. So hopefully that, uh, that gives you an idea of the importance of DNA and protein.